Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lori Smith on Blog Talk Radio. Good evening. It is 10 o'clock p.m. here in Calgary, Alberta, uh, Monday, the Monday night, June 27th. I'm glad to be here. This is child abuse prevention and human rights abuse prevention is up to us. And it's a 30-minute live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. And the chat room is open. I did pop a link in there. Oh, no, I didn't pop a link in there. I usually do pop links in there to what I'm talking about. Um, tonight I want to talk about um, common symptoms in adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. And this is from healthyplace.com. And it was it's put out in 2008, but um, um, it was updated in 2009, right uh, December 20th, 2009. There's some good information. I think it, it, it pretty much stands. It's pretty much standard information wherever you look um, as far as uh, regarding, you know, common symptoms of of childhood sexual abuse in adult survivors. So um, this is something that, you know, it's just, it just, I don't know, it just breaks my heart, you know, that anybody should have to deal with this. And I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse, so, you know, I know firsthand what this is all about. And, you know, it's, it's just sad. And I think that the more we talk about it, the better uh, the better everyone will be. We really need to get this out in the open. It needs to quit. It needs to be, you know, from center. If we're really going to change this and we're going to stop child abuse and we're going to stop these human rights abuses, we really have to be able to talk about them. And, you know, it's it's a reality for so many children. You know, there's a whole lot of society, um, a, a large portion of people and, and society itself that's in denial and likes to think, because it's, it's so horrible to think about a child who's suffering it and, and it's so horrible to think that people could do these heinous acts and these heinous things to children. So, so many times people just want to pretend that it's not happening or minimize it, make it sound like it's not that big of a deal. Uh, we even had, you know, not too long ago, I can't remember this person's name, but this one uh, person in the in the, um, in the uh, psychologist, or I don't know what, what she was, but she was a doctor of some type that stated that child sexual abuse doesn't hurt a child. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, well, okay, she certainly didn't ask for my opinion or any of my friend's opinions who were abused as children. But, um, you know, it, it's pretty sad, it's pretty horrific, and children are dying because they're of sexual abuse. I hope everybody knows this. So... My shows are really sensitive. Uh, I'm talking about abuse, and I don't sugarcoat it. I just tell it like it is. And so I ha- I place a discretionary warning on my shows. You know, I, I ask everybody to listen at your own discretion. I'm talking about abuse. It's a very sensitive subject, and yet we do need to talk about it. And I'm not, you know, it doesn't bother me to talk about it because I had to grow up with it, right? So I've dealt with this my whole life, so it doesn't bother me to talk about it. But I know for so many people, you know, it could cause discomfort. It could, could cause people to be... Um, you know, uncomfortable. So you have to know what's good for you to listen to. And if the topics of abuse, sexual violence, sexual abuse, anything like that bothers you, then you need to turn the show off. It is your discretion. And young people under the age of 18, I ask that you have permission to listen to my shows. Have an adult, someone who's older, a parent, caregiver, somebody who can help you make a decision whether you should be listening or not. Because my shows are really ultimately about stopping child abuse. But there's a lot of adult content on my shows. And so I believe in protecting children at all times. I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. And, you know, we're standing up to protect children. So you need to learn how to keep yourself safe online. So be sure and do that. You know, we're, we're trying to save children's lives, and you need to be a very, you need to be the biggest part of that. If you're under the age of 18, you know, you learn how to keep yourself safe online. You type into your browser, Internet Safety for Children, Online Safety, right? And this will take you to websites that have some great information on you know how to keep yourself safe online, what to do, what not to do in a chat room situation, you know how to keep yourself safe. So be sure and do that. So thanks, everybody. So we'll get right into this topic, and this is uh, common symptoms in adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. And I also want, if we have time, want to look at the effects of child, sex, child sexual abuse on children. And um, I've covered this before, and, and I've, I've actually probably read these, these articles out before on, on my shows, and I just figure, why not just cover it again? You know, this disturbs me. It's disturbing, you know, that children are being sexually used. The children are not sex toys, you know. I was not a sex toy, right? <laughs> so no child is a sex toy. And it bothers me that there's so many very sick individuals out there that like to use children, you know, sexually and in another, for every other purpose. It's very disturbing and disgusting. It's been happening since time began. Lots of people think it's something new, but it's been going on since way before. I mean, you know, back in Roman, Romans were sexually using children, too. I mean, this has been going on forever, right? Um, it's very, very sad. It's just it's just unfortunate that we haven't very come very far. Uh, we're still very barbaric and as a... As a as a life being on this planet, it's just disturbing. Uh, no child should ever have to. Uh, children should be allowed to be children, you know. And why not, you know, allow and afford a child the right to be a child, you know? 
They, they have plenty of time to be an adult. But there's all these very sick and twisted adults out there, and some young people, young children, do sexually use children. I hope everybody knows this. Uh, but there's lots of adults out there who know better. They know that they shouldn't be doing it, and they do it anyway. And all for their own, whatever for whatever reason they're doing it for. There's a number of reasons why people do this, but it's very sick and twisted. And you know, I like to speak out against it. So every chance I get, that's what I'm t- I'm talking about, and I'm I'm really right in everybody's face about it because it's so incredibly wrong. You know, I was used sexually as a child, and I I am not a sex toy. I was not a sex toy as a child. You know, I have a right to my own body, and you know, my my mother. I told my mother about this when it was happening because I was in pain and um, frightened. My mother, it was my one of my siblings, my, one of my brothers that was doing this, and my mom told me it was my problem. I was going to have to deal with it uh, and to wrap myself up like a, a mummy when I went to bed at night. That was her response. Um, I didn't push it. My mother was my main abuser and was beating me and uh, abusing me in every way, uh, except for sexually. But she was privy to this sexual abuse that was going on and did nothing about it, did nothing to stop it. And this is the case for so many children out here. You know, so many times, you know, even if they do disclose that they're being abused, it will continue on because the the person that they disclose the abuse to, either whether it's a family member or a parent or caregiver, somebody um, doesn't do anything about it. <laughs> so, what's the child going to do? They're they're vulnerable. Children are vulnerable. So, you know, if somebody decides to use a child as a sex toy, I mean, what's that child going to do? Even if they tell, quite often nothing is done. This is very disturbing and very disgusting. It never should happen. Never ever should happen. And, you know, the abuse, the, the shame doesn't lie on me. The, the shame is not mine. I don't carry that shame or the guilt. The shame and the guilt belongs to the perpetrator, and that would be my brother um, and my mother, right, for allowing it to continue on. But, I mean, my mother was my main abuser, and, and so, you know, shame on her as well, and my dad. So, you know, shame on them all. But the thing is, is if we don't talk about this stuff, it's never going to change. You know, there's so many survivors out here who have child, childhood sexual abuse. I know quite a few, and I will not mention them by name. But I know a lot of people who are survivors of child sexual abuse, and they they have all kinds of complaints of problems and physical problems, and so do I. And some of these problems, this is from HealthyPlace.com, and you can just type into your browser HealthyPlace.com, and it will bring up this website. And this article is called Common Symptoms in Adult Survivors of Childhood Sexual Abuse. And they said uh, physical, psychological, behavioral symptoms experienced by adults sexually abused as children and the impact child sexual abuse has on its adult victims. So they list off here physical symptoms of childhood sexual abuse, psychological and behavioral symptoms of childhood sexual abuse, and also um, after effects of childhood sexual abuse in adults. And the, the physical symptoms of childhood sexual abuse include things like chronic pelvic pain, gastrointestinal symptoms, distress, uh, muscular musculoskeletal complaints, obesity, uh, obesity, eating disorders, insomnia, sleep disorders, um, pseudocyces, pseudocyces, I'm not sure what that is, uh, sexual dysfunction, asthma, respiratory ailments, right? um, addiction, chronic headache, chronic backache, any number of things like this, chronic pain. You know, it's absolutely horrific that a child should, should have to deal with this and, and then grow up to be an adult and have these physical symptoms from the childhood sexual abuse. And there's people out here saying, oh, child sexual abuse doesn't hurt children. <laughs> I mean, okay, you know, that is completely wrong. And, you know, I don't know how that person, whoever said that and whoever says that, can sleep at night. Um, were they sexually abused? Because if they if they were, did they enjoy it? You know, this is the thing, I this is the question I ask. I know that it was incredibly painful to be sexually abused. Um, um, I was in a severe amount of pain, and that's why I told my mother in the first place. And so, um, and, and my mother was my main abuser, so I was taking a large risk at telling her, but I was in enough pain uh, that I did tell her. So that just tells you how serious it was. And so, you know, this is absolutely horrific that a child should have to deal with this and go through this um, and and then grow up to be an adult and have these issues and then have people tell it, trying to minimize it, trying to make it out that it, it's no big deal for a child to be sexually abused. Uh, now, the, I, I only actually heard of one person that's ever said that, and this was somebody who was in... Who was this article was going around? It was quite famous. It was in the newspapers. It was, it was in the news, and it was everywhere. And they're talking about it. This one person, and I can't remember their name, but they were saying that there was just nothing wrong with childhood sexual abuse, and it doesn't affect the children, and the children are fine. And I'm thinking, she didn't talk to me. <laughs> it was a woman who said that. And I'm like, she certainly didn't talk to me, and 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 because I, I could tell her the horrors of what I went through, being sexually used as a child, and what it did to me, you know, and to my whole being my whole persona, 
right? This is absolutely harsh and horrific, you know. Uh, talk about sexual dysfunction, <laughs> you know. And, and and the issue is 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 that you know, so many times. I mean, I, I was told that I, I was I was so. It's not that I was in denial. I, I just I just didn't want to believe that the damage had been done to my body, right? And so when I went in for a physical when I was 21 years old went in for a physical to get on the pill because I was interested in in intimate relations with this with this guy that I had been seeing and I was in love with him and we were talking marriage and it was a serious relationship and I was thinking okay I'm going to trust this one guy you know and uh went in to get a, a test and uh, to have a check my first checkup and they told me well you're not a virgin I was like I am a virgin they were like no no you're, you're honey you're not a virgin you want to talk about embarrassment and really rage and, and being angry, you know, because of what had ha- what had been done to my body against my wishes, against my will at the age of eight years old. So I'll tell you that it does hurt and it is disturbing and, and it does affect a person and it, it can be very, very damaging to a person's uh, psyche and body for, for a lifetime. Uh, it can do a lifetime of damage. Physically, I, I'm completely damaged, but psychologically, I'm getting better, you know. But it's just it's just so disturbing that people would think that this is okay when it's not. People out there trying to minimize child sexual abuse. And, and why? You have to wonder why anybody would try to minimize something as heinous as child sexual abuse. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. So it, someone out there is not thinking properly. You know, we have people hanging kids from from these uh, these disgusting garter belts from the ceilings doing sexual acts on them. We have pe- and, and you want to minimize child sexual abuse? You know what I mean? Like, we have people raping and sodomizing children, and you want to minimize child sexual abuse? You know, you can tell I'm on a bit of a rant here, but this makes me extremely angry that there's people in society who want to minimize it. Why? So that they can promote it? That's the only thing that I can think of. I mean, that's the only thing that comes to my mind, is that somebody wants to go ahead and make it okay so that they they can promote it. They are either on the side of the child sexual perpetrators who are out here uh, perpetrating sexual abuse against children, and they are they're all for it, they're pro abusing children, you know, or they're just completely ignorant. Because have you ever been sodomized? I can tell you it frickin' hurts. And especially when you're a young child, it hurts. It's not at all funny. And you know, I'm so I'm really tired of people minimizing child sexual abuse. I I'm tired of people minimizing abuse, period. <laughs> you know. It it just makes me angry, you know, because there's a lot of people out here who would like to, who do minimize it and make it out like, oh, it's no big deal. Children are resilient. You know, they just bounce back. <clears throat> yeah, great. Uh-huh. Yeah, it bothers me. So psychological and behavioral symptoms of childhood sexual abuse. Here's some issues. Depression and anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, dissociative states, uh, repeated self-injury, suicide attempts. These are things that can happen to adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Not all, but maybe some. Bad enough to have one of these issues let alone a bunch of them. I know all about this stuff. Uh, Lying, stealing, truancy, running away, poor contraceptive practices, compulsive sexual behaviors, sexual dysfunction, uh, somatizing disorders, eating disorders, poor adherence to medical recommendations, intolerance of or constant search for intimacy, so they either can't stand it or they're in constant search of it, Uh, expectation of early death. And this is quite interesting. I mean, I relate to almost all of that. And, you know, I don't think I'm dissociative, but I definitely have had lots of depression and anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, uh, repeated self-injury. You know, I, I was always wanting to self-injure, and I did a little bit of it, but not a whole lot. And I don't do that anymore because four years ago I made a commitment to myself that I would, uh, that that was the end, and I was never, ever going to do that again. And I was going to not only be a, a survivor, but I was going to be a thriver, and I was going to win, and I was going to... Uh, come out of this victorious, which I have, thank God. Um, compulsive sexual behaviors. I knew I knew people growing up who were sexually molested as children, who were very much into uh, were were, were nymph- nymphomaniacs because of it. And I myself shut down sexually because of the abuse that I had witnessed in my home and uh, the sexual dysfunction between my parents and watching my dad rape my mother in front of me. Uh, really, you know did a whole lot of damage on my psyche as far as sexuality and and and, and sexual you know intimacy is and, and what it should be which is a beautiful thing to me it was ugly and heinous and evil and everything that is bad 
And so I, it just shut me down uh, completely. And by then, when I was sexually abused by my brother when I was eight years old, and then I had some unwanted sexual touching by some of my brother's friends up until I was about 10 years old, um, 11 years old. And I had some peeping toms and stuff even after that. And my dad was ogling me in the shower as I was growing these prepubescent, you know, body parts uh, until I was about 15 or 16. You want to talk about being shut down sexually, um, completely shut down. And, um, you know, I still have many, many issues um, with, with, sex, with my own sexuality, but I'm working through them, thank God. But um, it's so damaging. It is so incredibly damaging. And expectation of early death, absolutely. I mean, I was abused in every way as a child, so I just didn't think, I, I wasn't planning on sticking around. <clears throat> I, was, I was thinking I was going to die a violent death, whether it was in my home or whether it was on the street. Because that's the lifestyle I had been living my whole life, and that's just the, well, the way I thought I was going to go. And so, um, you know, I wasn't planning for the future, right? So it's been relatively new for me to think about sticking around, you know, to a certain point and really trying to make something and trying to do something with myself and actually, you know, thinking about a pension and stuff like this because, of course, I wasn't planning on being here. So th it's incredibly damaging. And I hope everybody will realize that the childhood sexual abuse is. It's horrifying, heinous, and it never, ever should happen. And the minute I'll argue with somebody, I don't care who they are. I will tell them exactly like it is because there's so many people in society who are always trying to minimize it. Oh, it's no big deal. Yes, it is. And there's a whole lot of sick individuals out there lobbying the government, hundreds of thousands of them actually, lobbying the government to make uh, uh, adult uh, child sex legal. Oh, oh, my God. I'm telling you that this is so, so sick, you know. It's just so, so sick. There's no other word for it. After effects of child, child sexual abuse in adults, and they said although there is no single syndrome that is universally present in, in adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse, there is an extensive body of research that documents adverse short and long-term effects of such abuse. And so they said to appropriately treat and manage survivors of CSA, it is useful to understand that survivors' symptoms or behavioral symptoms resulting from childhood sexual abuse often represent, uh, represent coping strategies employed in response to abnormal traumatic events. So these coping mechanisms are used for protection during the abuse or later to guard against feelings or overwhelming helplessness and terror. And although some of these coping strategies may eventually lead to health problems, if symptoms are evaluated outside their original context, Survivors may be misdiagnosed or mislabeled. Very, very true. Uh, they said in addition to the psychological distress that may increase the effect of survivor's symptoms, there is evidence that abuse may result in, in, in biophysical changes. For example, one study found that after controlling for history of psychiatric disturbance, adult survivors had lowered thresholds for pain. It also had it has been suggested that chronic or traumatic stimulation, especially in the pelvic or abdominal region, heightens sensitivity, resulting in persistent pain, such as abdominal and pelvic pain or other bowel symptoms, which I've got all kinds of problems there. Um, although responses to sexual abuse vary, there is remarkable consistency in mental health symptoms, especially depression and anxiety. And they said these mental health symptoms may be found alone or more often in tandem with physical behavioral symptoms. And more extreme symptoms are associated with abuse onset at an early age, uh, extended or frequent abuse, incest by a parent, or use of force, which is what happened to me. Uh, responses may be mitigated by such factors as inherent resiliency or supportive responses from individuals who are important to the victim. So, you know, and that's just the whole issue. I mean, um, you know, uh, the, the, in my case, it wasn't somebody playing a game with me, and it wasn't considered to be a game, you know, like so many sick individuals do with children. Uh, mine, my, mine was force. It was violent. It was a uh, violent sexual assault, and it was um, a violent. It was violent sexual attacks on my body, and so you know it was absolutely horrific. And because I was not um, going along with what my sibling wanted me to do, it, I was forced into it and physically forced. And so, you know, it's absolutely horrific that somebody would do that to a child, but they do, and it's incredibly wrong. The whole thing is incredibly wrong. I mean, I know other survivors who have come through this with, where, you know, there was a, a, a family member, relative who played a game with them. You know, it, it doesn't matter. It's all so incredibly sick and it never, ever should happen. And so, you know, it, it, people out there, you know, for, for all those people out there that say childhood sexual abuse doesn't hurt a child, I got news for you. You know what I mean? You can come and talk to me. Um, it, it just bothers me that there's so many sick individuals out there that, that like to minimize abuse because it's a serious issue. 
Uh, we have a few minutes left, so we'll finish this up. There's this un- another article. It's from the same place, healthyplace.com. And this one was posted November 25th, 2008, and then updated um, September 22nd, 2009. And it's called The Effects of Child Sexual Abuse on Children. And they said, um, learn about the psychological and emotional impact of sexual abuse on children. So they said child sexual abuse has been reported, and this is an old article. I mean, obviously this is from 2009. So the stats would be different, right? Like the numbers are changed, the stats are different. But... um, you know, it's still good information. Um, so this is the stats from 2009, obviously. Or this was probably stats from like 2007. It takes like two years to get the stats, right? So my good friend Gypsy Witch is here. Hello, Gypsy Witch. And it said child sexual abuse has been reported up to 80,000 times a year, but the number of unreported instances is far greater because the children are afraid to tell anyone what has happened and the legal procedure for validating an episode is difficult. So the problem should be identified, the abuse stopped, and the child should receive professional help. And the long-term emotional and psychological damage of sexual abuse can be devastating to the child. So that not always, but it can be, right? So child sexual abuse can take place within the family by a parent, step-parent, sibling, or other relative, or outside the home, for example, by a friend, neighbor, child care person, teacher, stranger, right? When sexual abuse has occurred, the child can develop a variety of distressing feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. And I know, like, just for the stats that I've seen out there recently, and you know, that are that are out there that sort of public public knowledge, what everybody else is, it get, gets a hold of as well, or the stats that have been recently done, that say that three to four girls and six to seven boys, out, out, you know, three out of four girls and six out of seven boys will be um, sexually abused in some way under the age of 18. So that's, uh, that's, that, uh, that's uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, one out of three, I'm sorry, one out of three to four girls and one out of six to seven boys. So that's ridiculous. So if you're in a room with, I mean, let's just say randomly, um, three to four women, chances are one out of those three to four women will have been sexually abused under the age of 18. And if you're in a room with six to seven men in the room, chances are one out of those six or seven men will have been abused sexually under the age of 18. Now, that's too many. You know, we're always in rooms full of men and women, and that just tells you how many real how many real victims there are and how many real survivors there are of child sexual abuse. Those are the stats for child sexual abuse. That's also kind of go sort of standard for all the different types of abuse except for neglect, which is much more prevalent. But one in three to four girls and one in six to seven boys, I mean, that's ridiculous. That is, I, one is too many, you know? So you start getting into those kind of numbers and you just shake your head and go, oh my God, what is wrong with this society? What is wrong with these parents? What is wrong with these grandparents? What is wrong with these aunts and uncles and cousins and people and strangers and teachers and all these people that are out here sexually using children? It's incredibly wrong, and they they, they have to know that. You know, I don't know. People say it's a sickness or it's an illness. I don't know. I don't know what their problem is, but whatever it is, they need to stop doing that because it's not the child's problem until it's made their problem. Child sexual abuse wasn't my problem until it was forced forced on me, you know. (laughs) So that's just really disturbing. And so, you know, we really need to change the way that we feel about children. And we got to, there's all kinds of people lobbying the government to try to get, you know, adult child sex, adult child sex relationships um, legalized. What does that say about our society? We have a very sick, sick society. And we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Now, that's down in the States, right? Um, but that there, there needs to be people um, lobbying against that, you know, like the whole nation, right? Like the whole nation be, should be standing up and, and lobbying the government saying, no way, uh, no, right? This is so incredibly wrong. Let children be children, right? They have plenty of time to be adults, and all these sick people who want to use children for, for sex toys just need to bugger off and find something else. You know what I mean? Because I'm not a sex toy. I was not a sex toy at the age of eight years old. You know what I mean? And it bothers me that I was used as a sex toy. And that that makes me angry. You know what I mean? Like that, that should have never happened. So this is psychological trauma of child sexual abuse. They said no child is psychologically prepared to cope with repeated sexual stimulation. So even a two- or three-year-old who cannot know the sexual activity is wrong will develop problems resulting from the inability to cope with the overstimulation. And they said the child of five or older who knows and cares for the abuser becomes trapped between affection or loyalty for the person and the sense that the sexual activities are terribly wrong. So if the child tries to break away from the sexual relationship, the abuser may threaten the child with violence or loss of love. And when sexual abuse occurs within the family, the child may fear the anger, jealousy, or shame of other family members or be afraid that the family will break up if the secret is told. There's many reasons why children won't disclose 
um, child sexual abuse, you know, for many reasons. It's not just that they're being threatened, but it could be because they love that family member. It could be, um, you know, one of their, like, right in the family, a parent or, or a sibling or something, and they don't want to get that person in trouble. And quite often they're told, if you tell, you know, I'll go to jail, and then, you know, and then the whole family will, will will blame you, and it will be your fault. You know, they're they're guilted into not telling. They're made to feel like it's their fault, and that they're the ones that that wanted that, and they're the ones that that uh, brought that on themselves. So many times, that's what you know, sexual abusers will do. Abusers of any kind, actually, um, will will put that off on the child and make the child feel that it's their responsibility and make them carry the load. And that is absolutely horrific and wrong, but it happens all the time. And they said a child who is a victim of prolonged sexual abuse usually develops low self-esteem, a feeling of worthlessness and an abnormal or distorted view of sex, and the child may become withdrawn and mistrustful of adults and can become suicidal. And they said some children who, and this wouldn't be every child, this would just be some, right? Uh, some children who have been sexually abused have difficulty relating to others except on uh, sexual terms. And some sexually abused children become child abusers or prostitutes or have other serious problems when they reach adulthood. And they said often there are no obvious physical signs of child sexual abuse. Some signs can only be detected on physical exam by a physician. So they said um, sexually abused children may develop the following. Uh, unusual, and it's a good idea to pay attention to this stuff because a lot of it's behavioral, you know. If you notice a child, you know, uh, a child's behavior for a long, long time and you're used to being around this child and all of a sudden their behaviors change, here's some stuff you can watch for. Unusual interest in or avoidance of all things of a sexual nature. Sleep problems or nightmares, depression or withdrawal from withdrawal from friends or family, seductiveness, statements that their bodies are dirty or damaged, or fear that there is something wrong with them in the genital, genital area, refusal to go to school, delinquency conduct problems, uh, secretiveness, aspects of sexual molestation in drawings, games, fantasies, unusual aggressiveness or suicidal behavior, these types of things. You know, there's there's more symptoms than that, but this is just a this is just a selection of of some of the, the symptoms that, that children can, and not always, but some of them that they can develop and that you can kind of keep an eye on. You know, if your child is, has usually never had any sleep problems or nightmares or never really been depressed or withdrawn, and all of a sudden they're withdrawn, they're they're hanging out in the corner by themselves, they don't want to talk to anybody, they're, they're, feel, they're, they're you know, not sleeping and they're having nightmares, you can know something's going on with that child. So they said child sexual abusers may not be sexual abuse, but it's a good idea to find out what it is. And they said child sexual abusers can make the child extremely fearful of telling, and only when a special effort has helped the child to feel safe can the child talk freely. So they said if a child says that he or she has been molested, parents should try to remain calm and reassure the child that what happened was not their fault. And parents should seek a medical examination and psychiatric consultation and get the child away from the abuser. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised they didn't put that in there. But, but they said um, parents can prevent or lessen the chance of sexual abuse by telling children that if someone tries to touch their body and do do things that make them feel funny, say no to that person and tell them right away. They have a right to say no. you know. And, 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 and I think that's important. A lot of times parents will tell their children, you're going to do everything that that person tells you to do. Because parents don't want to hear any flack from the teachers, from the kindergarten teachers, or from the daycare workers. So they'll tell the children, you do everything they tell you to do. And you always listen to the adults. They are always right, and you you don't have the right to say no. That when you do, when they tell you to do something, you do it. And many times, children, you know, when they're being sexually abused, the, these other abusers will tell them, "You you have to do what I say," because your parents said that you have to do what I say. And the kids, of course, are just going to go, "Well, I guess so. Must be right." Be very, very careful what you tell your children. And you need to be aware that this stuff does happen. Uh, one in three to four girls, one in six to seven boys will be sexually abused under the age of 18 in some way. Whether that's, you know, like I said, un unwanted sexual touching, molestation, rape, you name it, uh, exploitation, you need it. You make sure that you look out for your children if you're a parent out there and you make sure that you, you know how to keep your children safe. You know, living in fear is not the answer. But getting the education and learning how to protect yourself and how and how to teach your children how to protect themselves is the answer. And it's not 100%, you know, uh, foolproof. You know, they, they still run the risk of being abused sexually and in every other way. But at least it's better than leaving them, you know, hanging there with no information at all, right? So thanks, everybody, for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks, Gypsy Witch, for joining me here tonight. And have a great night, everybody. I'll be back on tomorrow morning, 7 o'clock, um, 7 a.m. Um, instead of 6 because I'm sleeping in because I got this week off. So, so I'm taking a little bit of a, of a, a 
chance to sleep in this week. So I'll be back on 7 a.m. tomorrow. Have a great night, everybody, and take good care of yourselves. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.